Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Town Hall Seattle for our keynote address. I'm Hillary Hayden, the executive director at the Washington Fair Trade Coalition. As we get underway, thank you. <laughs> As we get underway this evening, I'd like to acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for their hospitality and for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. The Washington Fair Trade Coalition is a coalition of over 60 Washington state labor, faith, environmental, food justice, public health, student, and other social justice groups that are committed to creating a fair, balanced, and sustainable global trading system. We were born out of the 1999 WTO protest with a fierce dedication for standing up for trade justice. If you enjoy the program tonight, I hope you'll donate to WFTC. Um, there's a little donation bucket on the table downstairs, and I hope you'll also sign up for our newsletter and get involved in our work. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lori Wallach to give an action orientation about the trajectory of the trade movement since 1999. Lori is the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, a 25-year veteran of congressional trade, trade battles starting with the 1990s fight over NAFTA. She was named to Politico's 50 list of thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics for her leadership in the Trans-Pacific Partnership debate. Wallach is an internationally recognized expert on trade with experience advocating in Congress, foreign parliaments, trade negotiations, courts, government agencies, the media, and most importantly for us, in the streets. Wallach's specialty is translating arcane trade issues into accessible language. She's a graduate of Wellesley College and Harvard Law School. Please welcome Lori Wallach. Good evening, everybody. It is really funky to be here. Uh, 20 years, and actually it was the day before the protest, so in four days from when, at this venue, the International Forum on Globalization had its big teach-in. And um, some of the people who taught me the most in the world about globalization and trade, some of my heroes and our elders in the movement, were here with a lot of amazing activists and young people doing maybe the last little frosting on a cake that had been baked over the course of a year of educating, strategizing, training, planning, plotting, agitating, creating art and ideas. And that day and the next day on the streets of Seattle, history was made. Not only did the whole world get awoken to the fact that here in the belly of the beast, in the United States, where our corporations and our government were pushing the corporate rigged model of globalization, here 50,000 people from across the damn country went outside in the freezing rain to say, oh no, we're not okay with corporate rigged globalization either. You folks in developing countries, folks in Europe who've been protesting the WTO, we're with that party too. We want different rules for the global economy. And not only was that a coming out party of sorts for the US, but also it was an amazing success. The WTO expansion, supported by the world's biggest corporations that was slated to take what already was an octopus of WTO and expand its tentacles into more parts of our daily lives, constraining what our governments can do, what we can organize and aspire to for the kind of planet and communities and economy we want, but also creating new rights and powers for corporations as if they didn't already have enough. So here, people on the streets basically gave that last enzymatic push to what had been going on in the suites in Geneva with developing country negotiators saying, basta, we don't want it expanded, we want it fixed. Already at that point, the WTO was almost five years old, it was causing serious problems, and in many developing countries, there had been mass protests against establishment of the WTO in the first instance, against its first five years, and so 
those negotiators from the Caribbean, from Latin America, from Africa, a lot of who have been locked out of the actual decision-making rooms at the convention center, were watching the protests on TV. And that last little tweak where the streets and the suites came together, they went in and they said, uh-uh, uh-uh, we're not going for this. And they shut down WTO expansion. We shut down WTO expansion. The inside, the outside, people power won. Now, that was in a context. And I want to frame it a little bit because Professor Stiglitz is going to talk a little bit about some of the problems that have been caused, some of the data, but also what needs to be done going forward. Because those WTO protests were situated in a methodology of people power organizing that had broad cross-sectoral coalitions based in the country where you have political power, someone in your own country. The WTO is like a big marshmallow. You punch it, but you don't hit anything. It's insulated. Where we have power is the government officials from our country taking decisions to go to that kind of institution, which is designed to not be accessible to accountability. So country-based coalitions, depending on the politics in your country, of progressive sectors, labor, environment, consumer, environmental, family farm, faith, student groups here, united internationally with their counterparts from numerous other countries. Country-based campaigns internationally coordinated. That had already stopped the Multilateral Investment Agreement on Investment, the MAI. And by 2005, it had stopped the free trade area of the Americas, a 34-country expansion of NAFTA. Seattle was the sandwich. <laughs> Seattle was the meat. MAI was a fluke. Everyone wondered, boy, was that, how did that happen? Then Seattle happened, and people went, oh, God, it's not a fluke. And then the FTAA, with our brothers and sisters in Latin America doing amazing work. With the WTO, it took 15 more years and mass protests at ministerials in Cancun and Hong Kong and Geneva and tons of incredibly hard work in numerous developing countries and also very brave negotiators in Geneva to ultimately do away altogether with WTO expansion, which is a huge honking success. We should definitely celebrate. But as we celebrate, that remarkable success of people, people power over corporate power, that moment where the so-called unstoppable force of corporate globalization hit the truly immovable object called popular democracy. <laughs> when that happened, what was left are still the existing WTO rules, the rules that have led so many people to protest in the first instance. And there are tons of free trade agreements that have everything in WTO plus the lunatic investor state dispute settlement system. And there are thousands of bilateral investment treaties with those crappy rules. And so that version of corporate rig globalization, it's still in place. So when we were in the streets, we said, no new round, turn around. And my friends, the turnaround part still needs to be done. So I knew a lot about WTO when I started working on the events that would become the Seattle protests. But I got schooled in direct action and the power of people standing up bravely, directly, and stopping power that is against our interest. And the work we need to do together going forward is a combination of that direct interference with corporate power and inside work to make sure that we elect representatives, a president, who is going to represent the vision of people and planet first rules for the global economy that we want to replace, to do the turnaround. And we also can see places where there is some progress. So as we're thinking about the struggle we have going forward, and Professor Stiglitz is going to talk a little bit about some of the ideas of the kinds of things, the challenges. I mean, the rules of globalization obviously have to put the climate challenge first or we're not going to survive. We have systematically rules in place that undermine the values and goals that will determine our happiness and that of our families, our well-being, our, the sustainability of our economies and our planet. But there is progress. There is what we stopped that was bad. And there is the slow demise of investor state. 
And I want to just say one thing about the current fight, which is the WTO ain't getting the message on its own. So what's on the agenda for next year's ministerial? China wants to push new investment rules like ISDS into the WTO, as if we haven't stopped that over and over. And the big e-commerce platforms, the Googles, the Amazons, they want to handcuff governments from being able to regulate them and set those rules globally in the WTO. So we've got work to do for stopping more of the worst, but on the turnaround, I just say contemplate this. North American free trade agreement, model of many bad trade agreements. Right now, big fight about whether it's actually gonna become the renegotiated deal something worth supporting, but investor state dispute resolution is largely gone because everyone's work made it not viable for a U.S. trade agreement to have that again. Because you all helped make sure there was no majority for TPP, and the anchor that sank it was ISDS. So this time around, when they renegotiated the NAFTA, they said, oh God, we've got to get that out of there. And it is almost all gone, which is ginormous, because the rest of the world can look at that and go, oh my God, if even in the U.S., it's kind of like the same kind of coming out of Seattle, only with ISDS. So we should think about what we've achieved and then think about the hard work we have. And now we're going to have Professor Stiglitz talk about some more of the outcomes, but also with his new book, he's got a great vision of some of the things we need to fight for. So it's a great honor to be here. And I actually think someone else is introducing Professor Stiglitz. So I will just say thank you, Seattle, for the amazing historic event of 20 years ago and all the amazing work that's been done to fight for a people and planet first economy. Thanks. Thank you, Lori. Uh, that was a great message. I'm Stan Sorcher, president of the Washington Fair Trade Coalition. We're so pleased to see everyone here to the, uh, this evening to mark the 20th anniversary of the WTO protests in 1999. A uh, diplomat from Europe was in Seattle a while ago to promote a large, fair trade, uh, a large free trade agreement. He said that it and other free trade agreements would determine how life would be organized in 2050. Most people think that's the job of governments and uh, in a democracy to determine how life is organized. Joseph, yeah, uh, maybe not, right? Uh, Joseph Stiglitz is exceptional among uh, leading economists for his recognition that economics and politics cannot be separated, especially not in America's money-driven politics. We can't shy away from the need for collective action to address the problems of our complex 21st century world. We must rely, we must rely less on free markets and more on public policies that serve public interests. This is true domestically and even more so in the global economy where the policies built into NAFTA and the WTO have tried to create a form of global governance without global government. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz. Well, it's a real pleasure to be back uh, in Seattle uh, and to discuss, uh, once again, globalization. And uh, Lori and, and Stan have given uh, uh, a good introduction to, to many of the issues I want to talk about uh, this evening. Um, there are four things I want to uh, go through uh, this evening. First, I want to talk about uh, why the events uh, 20 years ago here in Seattle were so important. Uh, and then I want to talk about some of the economic theories that uh, lay behind uh, the, the trade negotiations, uh, the trade uh, uh, regime that we've had, why they're wrong, and uh, what are some of the new insights to, uh, to think about going forward. And third, I then want to talk about the evolution of trade policy in the uh, two decades since uh, the battle, battle for Seattle. Uh, it's uh, um, a few victories, but uh, many setbacks. And I'll try to describe, the, in particular, the challenge posed by uh, 
uh, the Trump trade agenda um, and uh, make a few remarks about how we should think about a progressive trade agenda, uh, how we ought to think about reforming globalization. And finally, trade is uh, only part of a broader uh, reform in the way our, our economy works, in some sense the way our, our politics work. Um, that was highlighted by uh, the remarks that Lori just made. Um, the, a lot of the issues are uh, related to the fact that uh, trade, the trade agenda has really tried to subsume issues uh, that ought to be part of our own domestic political agenda. But that means we ought to be thinking about what is the agenda that we ought to be pursuing. And um, our, the anger that was uh, shown to, uh, at the trade agenda 20 years ago um, really reflects uh, a dissatisfaction with much of the economic agenda uh, in the United States and, and, and around the world. So I want to really spend some time talking about what should a progressive uh, economic agenda look like and uh, how, how uh, we might achieve um, some better outcomes. So first, let me begin with uh, why uh, this 20th anniversary celebration uh, of the events 20 years ago is uh, so important. Um, they deserve to be remembered for, for several reasons. First, it was the first major global protest against globalization. Uh, in, in a way, uh, the anti-globalization movement became a global movement uh, and uh, had an uh, uh, impact uh, around the world. Um, it questioned the hypotheses underlying globalization uh, in particular, the uh, a belief that globalization would make everybody in every country better off. Uh, it was clear by then that that wasn't true, uh, that uh, many people, many countries were worse off. Uh, and as I'll remark a little bit later, uh, I saw that particularly uh, from the perspective of I, I was at that moment uh, the chief economist of the World Bank. And uh, I saw how the rules of uh, the international trading regime were hurting a lot of countries. Uh, that uh, uh, trade liberalization was much more effective at destroying jobs than it was in creating jobs. And so, uh, while it was promised that, that it would lead to more growth. Um, in fact, in places like Africa, it's led to deindustrialization and uh, 25 years of uh, economic stagnation. Um, and uh, the, the, the hypothesis that uh, everybody would be better off was itself a corollary of another hypothesis uh, which is known as trickle-down economics. Uh, the idea was that if that trade would make the economic pie bigger, and uh, in doing so, everybody would benefit. I should emphasize that there is no economic theory behind that idea. <laughs> and remarkably, uh, no evidence. Uh, in the subsequent uh, 25, uh, 20, uh, 20 years uh, since the Seattle protest, um, the evidence has, has mounted uh, very strongly. Um, in the United States, uh, GDP has continued uh, to go up. It's not a good measure of well-being, but it looks, uh, GDP has gone up. But the fact is that real wages at the bottom in the United States are at the same level that they were 60 years ago. So if you're one of the people with a limited education having a, 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 a low wage job, 
you haven't seen any benefit from all the growth that has occurred over more than a half century. Um, so it's clear that trickle-down economics hasn't worked. Um, even, uh, you know, the median, even in the middle, uh, things haven't gone very well. The median income of a full-time male worker, and the full-time workers are the lucky ones, the median income of a full-time male worker today is the same as it was 42 years ago. So it's very clear that trickle-down economics has not worked. But there was a deeper critique. Uh, uh, the way globalization was managed meant that some countries were worse off it was not every country that was better off. Uh, as I said, that was something that was, I saw uh, repeatedly from my perch uh, at the World Bank. Uh, it was also a critique of neoliberalism, market fundamentalism, an idea, I'll come, idea that I'm gonna come back to. Uh, another remarkable and important part of the Seattle protest is that it brought together environmentalists, labor activists, health advocates, those concerned with developing countries. It was thus an early example of what has since become more common, a coalition of movements, a coalition of the kind that will be absolutely essential if the progressive agenda is to be achieved. And in coming together, these groups recognized that all of them shared a vision of society, obviously with different emphases, a vision that was markedly different from that of the right. This coalition showed that economic arrangements, trade agreements, are, are about more than just trade. They, they touch on every aspect of our life. They reflect our values, and the resolution of these matters cannot be left to trade ministers and the special interests they represent. There was a deep democratic deficit in the way the trade agreements were arrived at, a deficit that was further exposed by the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, TPP. Let me make a, a, a few comments about this uh, democratic deficit because I think it is actually uh, at, at, at the core of much of the objection uh, to trade agreements. Uh, the first aspect, it, was it, it is, a, a, the trade agreements are a reflection of power. Um, the fact is that the corporate interests uh, have their views expressed in these trade agreements. Uh, and the study of how corporate uh, power has gotten their way um, is, is an important uh, issue for understanding the exercise of power in the United States. Um, it has to obviously to do with the, the power of money in our politics. Um, what I said in one of my earlier books, uh, that the United States has moved from a system of one person, one vote, uh, that was better described uh, by a system of one dollar, one vote. Um, and, <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, the second aspect of, of this democratic deficit is the lack of transparency. Um, that uh, the trade agreements uh, are negotiated in secret. Uh, not even members of Congress uh, were able to find out what the negotiating position of the United States was. Uh, and the negotiating position of the US trade representative was actually different uh, and opposed to the position that the President of the United States had taken on a number of issues. So, uh, uh, and, and one never knew were these negotiating positions or positions uh, uh, that were really hard and fast, uh, what was going on. Um, and obviously, uh, the lack of transparency should be something that we should be very disturbed about. The third is that uh, over time, tariffs have come down, uh, and the major trade issues are no longer the issues of tariffs. The average tariff between the United States and Europe now 
uh, is under 3% on both, is around 3% on both sides. So tariffs are not really very important. You know, if you eliminated these 3% tariffs, it wouldn't make any difference. The fluctuations in exchange rate that happen uh, every week are greater than these 3%. So trade, the, the tariff barriers are not really the important thing. It's the non-tariff barriers. What do they mean by non-tariff barriers? They're the regulations. Um, and the regulations uh, are the rules by which our society lives. And the question is, who should set those rules? Should they be set by trade negotiators in non-transparent trade negotiations in which corporate interests exercise their power? Or should they be set in a more democratic way through our Congress? Uh, and uh, obviously, I think the right answer is that they should be set by a more democratic process. And I'll come back to give one example a little bit later, but. Um, a, a very uh, important issue right now is what are the rules governing uh, the digital economy? And uh, we are just waking up to uh, the dangers of a world without adequate digital rules. And it's not just about monopoly, uh, it's about privacy, uh, it's about uh, uh, political manipulation, uh, even uh, issue, liability, uh, pornography. It's a whole set of issues that have opened up that the digital companies understand what is in their interest, and we're beginning to understand what is in their interest may not be in our interest. And what the digital companies are trying to do is to make sure that our democratic processes will not work by embedding uh, ag the agreements about what the digital uh, 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 constraints on, on what digital regulations will be in our trade agreements. And they've already succeeded in one of the trade agreements that's been passed, and they're trying to get it in some of the others. So uh, that is uh, the third important aspect of the uh, democratic deficit. And the fourth is that uh, we delegated to the president enormous amount of power in uh, trade. Uh, we don't delegate to the president the power to uh, set budgets. So that has to go through Congress and it's in the Constitution. Um, the idea was that in battlefields, you need to delegate to the president. But somehow, we slip from battlefield in military to the use of language, trade war and to say that in a trade conflict, the president has to have this enormous authority. That delegation was done under the assumption that there was a responsible president and that it would be used only occasionally in the context of, 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 of a, uh, an unusual situation. Not to be used, uh, nobody expected it would be used as a tool, um, as an instrument for uh, issues of immigration, issues of uh, you don't like what a country is doing in one area or another area, and you use trade policy to badger them uh, as an instrument uh, uh, giving complete discretion to the president. What is even more disturbing is the opportunity for corruption that it opens up. Because the way we administer uh, these powers is the president says, okay, we're going to have a 10% or 15 or 20 or 25% tariff against imports from a given country, but if you apply, we can uh, give you an exemption. But the exemptions are given not on the basis of any simple set of rules, uh, it's total discretion. And total discretion is the discretion to give it to your friends or campaign contributors.
And we know that there are no boundaries and norms uh, that our president exercises. So that the dangers of, of, uh, whole, of corruption in this area are, are not uh, minuscule. So there is a, a huge democratic deficit that has opened up uh, in the way trade policy uh, uh, has evolved. That's why the protest uh, in Seattle was not just about trade, but was based on a broader critique of the direction in which our society was moving, uh, a critique that I think is even more relevant today, 20 years later. The protest was successful. President Clinton had hoped to start a new uh, round of trade negotiation. Um, perhaps he remembered that one of the earlier rounds of trade negotiations was called the Kennedy Round. And uh, I think he hoped that this would be called the Clinton Round. Uh, but uh, of course now uh, that idea sounds, uh, uh, is, is gone into uh, history. And what would people remember are the, uh, is the battle for Seattle. Uh, the Clinton round didn't happen, uh, but in the global unity that followed 9-11, uh, a new round of negotiations was begun. It was supposed to be about promoting development um, to uh, rectify the inequities that were, had been evident in the previous round called the Uruguay round that was concluded in 1994. Uh, uh, most of you probably don't remember that round, but, but the, the, there were two things that the developing countries asked for, the two things that the developed countries asked for. Uh, the round was trying to bring the developing countries within the global trading regime. And the developed countries got the two things they wanted, including intellectual property rights, which I'll come to later, but the developing countries didn't get what they wanted. And uh, they were told, be patient, you'll get it maybe eventually. Um, and uh, by uh, the end of the 1990s, it was clear that uh, 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 that inequity had not been rectified. And so it, as a condition for starting a new round of trade uh, negotiations, uh, the agreement was that it focused on rectifying these mistakes, and that's why it was called the development round. But, um, but then Europe and the United States reneged on the promises they had made. Uh, and uh, as the injustices and deficiencies of the Uruguay round seemed to fade into ancient history, and the, and the round, the development round, was finally abandoned 14 years later, and with it, the attempt at a broad multilateral trade agreement. To repeat, while the protests were about a trade agreement, there, were more, there was much more at stake. Globalization was and is the battlefield in which controversies over values, beliefs about our economic and political system, the nature of democracy, have and are being played out. Trade agreements seem to put GDP and corporate profits on a pedestal, prioritizing them even as they gave short shrift to other values like democracy, who should determine the regulations by which we live, the, uh, the environment, even the right to access to medicines, and therefore the right to live. Uh, for developing countries, uh, e the right to develop uh, was put subservient to these uh, trade policies including the right to have industrial policies. I now want to turn to the issue of, of uh, putting uh, the trade agreements within uh, a broader economic context. The trade and other economic agreements of that era, and still so today, were largely based on a set of now discredited economic doctrines called neoliberalism or market fundamentalism. Uh, which basically claimed that unfettered markets would deliver economic prosperity for all. Even as these ideas were being popularized, developments in economic theory were explaining why they were wrong, as if we needed proof beyond what our own eyes showed us. 
In particular, uh, market failures, instances where markets did not result in efficiency, uh, were uh, um, uh, pervasive. Uh, and many of our critical problems, environmental degradation and pervasive pollution, growing inequality, economic instability, as evidenced by the 2008 crisis, are the result of underregulated markets. In the past 20 years, we have seen markets deliver us the opioid crisis, the childhood diabetes crisis, a health crisis such that life expectancy in the United States is in decline, setting us apart from other countries, where life ex uh, and a country where the life expectancy of the rich is years longer than that of the poor. My own work showed that in the absence of perfect information, which is always the case, the pursuit of self-interest did not lead to the well-being of all. Uh, I sometimes put it slightly differently. The reason that the Adam Smith's invisible hand, Adam Smith, had, the, uh, the founder of modern economics, had argued that the pursuit of self-interest would lead, as if by an invisible hand, to the well-being uh, of everybody. And uh, one of, uh, I think, my most important analytic results in my research was to show that the reason the invisible hand was invisible was that it wasn't there. <laughs> and, other advances explain why markets were not in general competitive, why shareholder value maximization did not lead to societal well-being, that economists' assumptions concerning the nature of mankind, either in its extreme irrationality or selfishness, did not provide an accurate depiction of human behavior. The protest of 20 years ago provided a foreshadowing of what is now clear. The experiment with neoliberalism in the US uh, we typically refer to this as supply-side economics. Um, that experiment, which had begun 40 years ago, uh, I think can be declared, after 40 years, a failure. We need an alternative approach. In my recent book, People, Power, and Profits, I suggest an alternative, which I call progressive capitalism. Uh, some people call that uh, idea an oxymoron. Um, but I try to explain uh, in the book that any complex society like ours needs uh, decentralization. Uh, and when I talk about capitalism, it means that there's going to have to be an important role for markets, but not the kind of unfettered markets that have characterized uh, the United States over the last 40 years. Uh, and uh, what one needs is uh, a, a very different kind of market economy. Um, others refer to similar ideas under names like reinvigorated social democracy or democratic socialism. Uh, what you call it doesn't matter. What is essential are certain uh, uh, key ideas that I'll elaborate uh, uh, over the course of this talk. Um, but one of the, uh, two of the important ideas uh, underlying this is first, uh, it recognizes that a successful society must be based on a rich ecology of institutional arrangements. Uh, the, the dichotomy into markets in the state is really a, a, a false dichotomy. Uh, it, it may sound a little bit self-interest, but uh, I think one of the most successful uh, institutions uh, in the United States are our universities. And our uh, most successful universities are all either state universities, like University of Washington uh, or University of California, or not-for-profit universities, uh, foundations like Columbia, Harvard, uh, uh, and Stanford. So, um, uh, the only uh, uh, the sort of emblematic of the for-profit universities is Trump University. 
And uh, it excels in one area, which is figuring out how to exploit the vulnerable. Uh, people who want to get ahead and, and take, uh, take advantage of them, as you all probably know, uh, Trump had to uh, settle uh, millions of dollars of suits uh, against Trump University for deception uh, and fraud. So um, uh, that's just an illustration of one important set of institutions in our society. Uh, NGOs, labor unions are, are other important institutions uh, in our uh, society. Um, cooperatives uh, are an important set of institutions. Uh, the only part of our financial system that did not engage in the kind of rapacious behavior uh, of uh, predatory lending, market manipulation, insider trading, you name it, they did it. The only part that did not engage in that were our cooperatives, our credit unions. And, <laughs> and they were actually, interestingly, after the crisis, they were the only part of our financial system that expanded lending to small and medium-sized enterprises, actually doing what the financial institution is supposed to do. So it's important to realize that, that a successful economy has to have a rich set of institutions and ought to take an active role in trying to encourage uh, this variety. Finally, I want to emphasize that economic relations shape who we are. Cooperatives encourage cooperative behavior and, have, and, and, and this has obviously broad implications for the nature of our society. I won't have time to elaborate on this in my remarks this evening. I do want to emphasize the importance of this idea, what economists sometimes refer to as endogenous preferences. Nowhere, perhaps, were the failures of neoliberalism greater than in trade policy. And this is particularly relevant for today's commemoration. So I want to spend a few minutes reviewing trade theory and trade policy, especially in light of what has happened in the past 20 years. The history of trade agreements uh, in the period after the Seattle protest until the advent of Trump was mixed. The multilateral system was increasingly replaced by regional and bilateral agreements, a complicated spaghetti bowl of entanglements, which typically were more dominated by corporate interests from the advanced countries, paying less attention to issues of the environment and health and labor and and more unfair to developing countries. Not a surprise, because bargaining power favored large developed countries. These trade agreements gave investors new property rights in the so-called investor agreements, or ISDS provisions. They weakened further the bargaining power of workers and made environmental and health regulations all the more difficult. In many ways, matters became worse. Consider, uh, for instance, uh, one particular issue uh, that I've been involved in is access uh, to generic medicines, which is very important for, for health. Um, the uh, pharmaceutical companies have been very successful in putting in very complicated provisions uh, that are designed to make it difficult to get access to generic medicines. Uh, they're called data exclusivity. Uh, they, they, they're, they're, they're just uh, a whole set of uh, provisions that, that make it more difficult for uh, generics to come in to the markets. Uh, I was uh, on an ILO, uh, International Labor Organization Commission, called uh, the Social Dimensions of Globalization uh, in, in, in around 2003. And uh, this, uh, uh, the ILO is an interesting institution because it brings together uh, government, NGOs, civil society, and labor, um, and business together to, to uh, and we managed to uh, 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 get uh, unanimity consensus on the fact that 
uh, the intellectual property provisions of the WTO were uh, not good, uh, to put it uh, uh, bluntly. Um, and we called for uh, what we call TRIPS minus. The, uh, TRIPS was the trade-related intellectual, uh, intellectual property provisions. They're not trade-related, they cover everything. Uh, the only reason they're called trade-related is they wanted to stuff them into a trade agreement. Uh, but they were really just uh, intellectual property provisions. And we called for um, reforming these in, in ways that would um, uh, make access to generic medicines more accessible, which is particularly important in, in poor countries, but also important in the United States because we don't have access, uh, we don't have a, uh, we don't recognize the access uh, to, to healthcare as a basic human right. Um, so, uh, but unfortunately, in the, in the years since then, the 15 years since our commission made its report, uh, all the bilateral trade agreements, or almost all of them, have actually made things worse. Uh, they have actually made access to generic medicines more difficult. So the basic point I wanted to make is it became increasingly clear that trade agreements are about far more than trade, and they certainly weren't free trade agreements as the U.S. liked to refer to them, or partnership agreements, as Europe liked to refer to them. If they were free trade agreements, they would be about three pages long. Uh, we get rid of our tariffs, you get rid of yours. We get rid of our non-tariff barriers, you get rid of yours. We get rid of our subsidies, you get rid of yours. And that would be it. Uh, as many of you know, TPP went on for 6,000 pages. Uh, it wasn't three pages long. Uh, they were not free trade agreements, they were managed trade agreements. And this is the point. Because they were so long and so detailed, it enabled them to be managed for the corporate interest in the United States and Europe. I was once asked by the president of an emerging country uh, that had been offered a so-called free trade agreement uh, with the United States, whether he should sign. I knew he was a doctor, and so I asked him, had he signed the Hippocratic Oath, the critical provision of which is, uh, do no harm. Uh, and of course I knew that he had. Um, and he said, yes, he had signed uh, the Hippocratic Oath. So I said, uh, you can't sign it. <laughs> But I suggest that he make a counteroffer, that he offer to sign a true free trade agreement and see what the United States' response would be. <laughs> of course, we all knew the answer. The U.S. has never been interested in signing a free trade agreement. It would require dealing with a host of special interests, getting rid of agricultural subsidies to the corn farmers, for instance. Um, In the subsequent two decades after the Seattle protest, there were a few positive uh, developments. The WTO panel, at least in some respects, worked better than many feared. In some cases, it showed that the medal to rule against, the large and uh, uh, against large and powerful countries like the United States. In some cases, it seemed to show respect for other values like the environment. These positive developments were, however, almost surely overshadowed by the negative developments. In other cases, for instance, it seemed to treat as trade barriers regulations which were, should have been totally within the prerogative of a country. Uh, investment agreements, such as Chapter 11 of NAFTA, were used to stifle environmental regulations. Canada and Mexico lost numerous cases, and that was a, had a chilling effect on regulation. The agreements were one-sided. Uh, corporations had rights without responsibilities. They could not be sued for not living up to their obligations. 
uh, citizens who thought their environmental or other rights had been abrogated uh, could not uh, bring a suit. A Canadian lawyer uh, who had helped draft uh, Chapter 11 of NAFTA boasted that if a children's cereal contained plutonium, and by the way, you should know, plutonium is not good uh, <laughs> for your health, um, uh, a, a, he, he boasted if Canada imposed a regulation forbidding plutonium in children's cereal, he would sue and he would win. <laughs> Around the world, outrageous suits were filed. Uruguay was sued for a regulation requiring cigarettes to disclose that they were dangerous for one's health because the disclosure led to less smoking as intended. Um, they demanded, Philip Morris demanded, a compensation for the loss of profits. Their view was that they had a fundamental right to kill. Uh, and uh, that uh, the uh, requirement that they uh, uh, disclosed that the cigarettes were bad for your health was interfering with this fundamental right that they had to sell things that were uh, poisonous. Uh, this was a view that Europe had, had claimed in the 19th century when they went to war with China with the support of the United States in the opium wars to ensure their fundamental right to get China addicted to opium. If these provisions had been in place when it was discovered that asbestos was dangerous for one's health, and if the owners of the asbestos companies were foreign, then instead of requiring the asbestos companies to compensate us for the risks they imposed on our health, we would have to compensate the asbestos companies for not killing us. We would have to compensate them for their lost profits. What I want to emphasize is this illustrates how in the trade agreements, there is a fund can be a fundamental change in property rights. But this was buried in the trade agreement. In fact, uh, I was very sensitive to this issue because in the 1990s, the issue had been discussed more publicly and totally rejected by all three branches of the US government uh, under the name of regulatory takings, where, where the, 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 those who wanted to despoil the environment said that if you stop us from despoiling the environment, you have to pay us not to ruin the environment. Uh, that was called a regulatory taking. And we said, you know, that's absurd. Why should the public compensate you for not damaging us? <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, the administration took a strong view on that, Congress supported this, and the courts supported this. And yet, in trade agreements, we have been uh, taking exactly the opposite view. Uh, and I think we can understand why they prefer using trade agreements, precisely because of the democratic deficit that I talked about before. If you bury it in a trade agreement, in secret trans uh, uh, negotiations, you put in a 6,000 uh, page document, who's going to notice it? So that's why uh, that's become the, the venue of choice uh, of getting through these kinds of, uh, of provisions. There are many areas in which domestic regulations may affect uh, trade but citizens should have the right to determine for themselves the regulations under which they live. Values should trump trade and investment. In Europe, for instance, many are concerned about GMO, genetically modified uh, foods. Without saying whether those concerns are right or wrong, they are deeply felt, and they are not motiva motivated by protectionism, yet they have trade consequences. With so much of American production based on GMO, America, uh, 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 Europe, if it was disclosed that uh, the uh, wheat or the uh, 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 pasta has uh, American grain in it, 
they won't buy it. Well, American trade negotiators recognized this, uh, and so they have argued against transparency. Their view is that the disclosure would be a trade barrier. But European citizens, I believe, rightly, uh, uh, they have, uh, have the right to know what they are eating. So that's an example of, of how uh, uh, our trade negotiations, negotiators are trying to undermine, uh, you might say, the basic values, things that people care very deeply about and trying to circumscribe what governments can do, reflecting what citizens want. One of the areas not well covered in older trade agreements, such as NAFTA, was high tech, the digital economy. It developed largely after that agreement was completed. But the new trade agreements, such as that with Japan, embody protections for this industry that are questionable at best and more reasonably should be viewed as unacceptable. Protection from liability with insufficient safeguards for privacy. I'll return to this uh, later in this talk. 2016 marks, however, a major change in the trade framework. Until then, underlying trade discussions were what might be called a neoliberal view of the world, to which I alluded earlier, which said that markets basically work well, extending markets will increase prosperity from which all countries and all individuals will benefit. It was also based on Francis Fukuyama's view of, uh, that became popularized after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, he called it the end of history. We are all converging, he thought, to liberal democracies and free market economies. The more rapidly we take down borders, the more rapidly we will converge. Uh, all those ideas uh, of Fukuyama seem a little bit naive uh, from the current perspective, and I think he, even he has now uh, changed his mind. Uh, but Trump put a, a, a forward a very different view more reminiscent of 17th century mercantilism than 20th century neoliberalism. Um, he uh, uh, thought, uh, Trump has argued that trade was an area for the projection of power. International law was limiting our ability to exercise our power and until it are surrendering our sovereignty. Trump was thus criticizing our trade agreements just as the protesters in Seattle did 20 years ago. But I want to emphasize that there's a huge difference between the two critiques. <laughs> and it's important to understand these differences. I don't know how many of you feel uh, discomfort realizing that uh, you are, you've pr been uh, protesting trade and Trump has been protesting trade and uh, uh, if you made that uh, uh, as an analogy, since you both are doing the same thing, you must agree with each other. <laughs> um, first, to put the whole set of issues in historical perspective, differences about trade policy have been at the center of economics since the beginning of modern economics some 250 years ago. In the late 18th century, mercantilists argued for trade protection, Adam Smith, who I mentioned before, argued for free trade. Early 19th century discussions of economic policy in the UK were about the repeal of the Corn Laws, uh, about uh, the repeal of these uh, agricultural tariffs, uh, which had raised the price of food, increasing incomes of landowners at the expense of the rest of society. Later in the 19th century, industrial tariffs were advocated as a way of encouraging domestic industries and promoting development, both in Europe and the United States, and opposed by agricultural interests who felt threatened by higher prices for the products that they needed to import. By the middle of the 20th century, European and American industrialists had become advocates of trade agreements that got them greater access to foreign markets. Suddenly, in 2016, our business leaders fell silent about these principles and even worse, joined the Trumpian course. We need to ask, has the anti-globalization movement finally found a leader in the form of Trump? <laughs> and have our business leaders suddenly had a moment of epiphany and seen the light? Well, 
uh, as you might have thought. Uh, the answer to both questions is no. Throughout history, business leaders have, in fact, had a remarkably consistent position. They are in favor of whatever maximizes their profits. If free trade does so at one time, they hold forth on principles of free trade. If protection does it, does it another, that is, to where they, that is where they stand. It is not principle that guides them, but self-interest. And Trump is leading the world into a much more dangerous direction a direction every bit as bad or even worse than that of the neoliberal movement based on the blind faith in globalization and markets. There are issues of fairness and economic efficiency, and let me deal with each. Trump claims that the trade agreements are unfair to the United States. Uh, I have said in my book that trade agreements are unfair to developing countries. So I sometimes ask my students, uh, which of us is right, Trump or me? Uh, well, you can guess what uh, my students say. Uh, but uh, Trump suggests that our trade negotiators were snookered. Uh, but the, in reality, anybody who knows about how these trade agreements are written knows that the, we wrote those trade agreements. So we did not snooker ourselves. But the problem is that they were written not by us in this room. They were written, as I mentioned earlier, by and for corporate interests. And so that's the problem. They were written by the United States, but not for the benefit of the people in the United States, but for the benefit of corporate interest in the United States and against uh, as I'll explain a little bit later, the interest of workers in the United States. Consider even NAFTA, which allowed the U.S. to keep subsidized corn. This hurt poor corn, farm, corn farmers in Mexico. Acreage expanded in the U.S. and contracted in Mexico. And uh, earlier in one of the workshops, we uh, uh, had a, a good discussion about how this in, in turn uh, affected uh, uh, the poorest people in Mexico uh, and uh, gave rise to uh, some of the problems that we face uh, today. Trump's analysis of why we need new trade agreements, if an analysis is a word that loses its dignity when applied to his utterances, uh, says trade agreements cause trade deficits. Trade deficits cost American jobs, especially good manufacturing jobs, and his new trade agreements, if he could ever conclude them and get them passed by all the relevant uh, Congresses, will bring back these jobs. On each account, he is wrong, and badly so. And I'm sure he would have learned this at Wharton if he had only paid attention. <laughs> uh, the multilateral trade deficit is what matters for jobs not the trade deficit between the U.S. and any particular country, including China. And the, macro, and the multilateral trade deficit, the difference between our exports and our imports, is determined basically by macroeconomics, by the disparity between domestic savings and domestic investment. Uh, and it's not really changed by trade agreements. Trade agreements affect which country and which good we import from particular countries or export to particular countries, but not the overall level of the disparity between our exports and our imports. Uh, it can be, the, the, the trade deficit uh, can be affected by misguided tax policy, and in the case of the United States it was. So the consequence of this is that in spite of all the rhetoric that you've heard about strong trade policy, the trade deficit in the United States, the multilateral trade deficit, in just two years between 2016 and 2018, the first two years uh, of uh, Trump, increased, increased by 22%. So that's a remarkable achievement. Uh, um, especially by somebody who's claiming that his whole 
thrust is to lower the trade deficit. And actually, the evidence uh, it looks like for uh, now that we're getting data in uh, for 2019, it looks like it's going to go up uh, again this year for the full year. It's on track for going up for uh, projected to be about, compared to 2016, uh, about 30 percent higher. Every economist rejects Trump's focus on bilateral trade agreements, and most such agreements, as I said, just change the country from which we import goods. Uh, but even here, uh, we have failed. Our bilateral trade agreement, uh, trade, trade and goods deficit with China has increased markedly uh, between 2016 and 2018. And the trade agreements won't bring back jobs to the United States. Even if the manufacturing were to be brought back in any significant quantity, it will be high-tech, largely produced by robots, and not in the places and of the skills of the jobs that were lost. Um, Trumpian's uh, uh, incorrect view is that trade is generally zero or ne possi possibly negative sum. Um, and uh, again, on this account, Trump is wrong. Trump, trade can be mutually beneficial if it is managed well. And some countries have managed it uh, reasonably well. The US, I think, has not. And of course, it's always easy to blame others for one's own mistakes. At the same time, it is by now clear that globalization was oversold. The advocates of free trade exaggerated its growth benefits and underestimated its adverse effects on distribution. In fact, economic theory uh, was fairly clear about uh, two things. First, that trade globalization would increase, as, uh, trade globalization with developing countries and emerging markets would increase inequality. So the impact of trade on inequality should not have come as a surprise, um, but it seemed to. Uh, and the second thing is that um, even though, even if trade increased total income, it didn't mean that everybody would be better off. That, uh, depend, that, that, that assumption was the trickle-down assumption that I mentioned before. Um, all the theory said that everyone could be winners. Uh, um, but that wouldn't happen uh, without strong government policies. And the conservatives prevented the actions that needed to be taken to make sure that everybody would be. In fact, you know, in, in, uh, uh, when uh, uh, the Democrats proposed the trade agreements, they argued for strong trade adjustment assistance and uh, the Republicans opposed it. And the question, I, I, for a long while I couldn't understand why, because usually in politics you'd want to get everybody on board, and you would think that by giving more trade adjustment assistance you would help the people who would be losers, and that would get more political support. Until I thought about it and thought about uh, the reason for some of the investment provisions, which were really giving away one of the strongest uh, comparative advantages the United States has, which is strong property rights. So you're giving it, you're saying even stronger property rights if you invest abroad than if you invest at home. Um, they wanted a weak labor market because with a weak labor market, they got lower wages abroad, but they also got lower wages at home and that meant they got higher profits. So the consistent pattern here is they advocated policies that increased their profits regardless of the impact that they had on American workers. Let me repeat, the problems presented by globalization, for instance, deindustrialization, are only partly the result of unfair international rules or others taking advantage of the US or other developed countries but are the result of the failure to help the, in the restructuring of the U.S. economy or the economy of other advanced countries, 
the absence of industrial and active uh, labor market policies, and helping individuals adjust to the economic transformation, to, uh, uh, policies that would have helped them share in the gains from globalization. And, uh, um, and it's clear that some countries have done a much better job than others. Um, so what I want to make clear is there is not just a choice between going back to the old neoliberal trade regime and doubling down and hoping that it will work better, uh, or the Trumpian uh, nativist uh, protectionism. There is the possibility of a progressive uh, trade agenda. Um, protectionism and the retreat from multilateralism won't solve the problems and it may make them worse. Uh, in particular, uh, as we look around the world, it is a much more dangerous place, and we live in a single planet. Just to mention one area, climate change, we need cooperation of, of, of everyone. Uh, the, the carbon molecules uh, don't carry uh, passports or visas. Uh, and no matter where they get emitted, they move all over the, the world. So we need global cooperation on climate, we need uh, global cooperation on nuclear proliferation. Uh, the same thing is true about uh, diseases that can go across border, borders. So there, there are a whole set of issues uh, on which we need global cooperation. And you can't separate out cooperation in one area uh, from that in others. And if we are acting in a hostile and non-cooperative way um, in uh, trade, we aren't going to get as effective cooperation in these other areas uh, in which we need cooperation so badly. Um, so, we are going to have to figure out how to cooperate uh, with others, and that raises the question of how do we form, re reform globalization? Uh, how do we, uh, what, what are some of the issues in a progressive trade agenda? Um, successful and, political, uh, and politically acceptable multilateralism will require changing current rules. Um, for instance, monetary and other policies of the large systemic countries are undertaken with little regard for the consequences elsewhere among emerging markets and developing countries. Uh, but there are some very difficult issues now that we realize that we aren't quickly converging uh, with other countries. We have to ask questions like, how do we liberalize among countries with fundamentally different values? Values get reflected, as I said before, in our rules and regulations. Different values thus lead to non-tariff, uh, what can be called non-tariff barriers. Uh, what degree of harmonization uh, is desirable? I already mentioned uh, the issue of GMO, and I'll come to a second about privacy standards. The question is, can we construct a global rules-based trading regime in a world with different political and economic systems in which countries ha can have uh, policy space consistent with their economic model and social values? Gains from trade can be achieved, but countries do not impose excessive costs on others. Um, and uh, in my book, I, I uh, suggest some of the answers. Um, uh, let me uh, talk about one particular example that I think needs to get uh, some attention. Uh, we are facing a major challenge. Who is going to write the rules of the digital age? The rules governing privacy, disinformation, liability, hate speech, political advertising, political manipulation, rules which will affect our economic and political lives, including the concentration of market power and the magnitude of inequality. And the issue is, to put very simply, will it be our corporations through their influence in secretive trade negotiations or will it be through our democratic political process? <laughs>
And I can't emphasize how important this is because these issues are now being put into trade agreements that are being formulated and getting very little attention. These are really the issues that will be affecting our lives over the coming decades. And they are being settled without any discussion in the trade agreements that the digital giants are, the terms of which the digital giants are, are, are winning uh, in how our trade agreements uh, are designed. Well, this example shows the constant vigilance we need to be on as trade negotiations proceed. There may be a temporary victory here or there. Uh, the new trade agreement with Mexico and Canada may have improved uh, uh, a few provisions, um, for instance, investment agreement, um, but expect there to be pushback. And with an administration without guidance of principles and understanding of economics, expect new boundaries to be broken. The agreement with, <clears throat> with Korea <clears throat> seemingly subjects even our monetary policy to oversight by trade representatives. A part of the agreement that got little attention in the United States seems to be done without even consulting with the Federal Reserve, but has raised hackles with central bankers elsewhere in the world. I, a discussion with one of the um, uh, head of the central bank in Asia uh, was horrified uh, with uh, the Korean agreement for what it implied for the conduct of monetary policy. But somehow this is an issue that's not gotten uh, very much attention. So finally, let me return to the bigger picture, reconstructing our economic system of which trade is but one part. Um, think for a minute about the enormous increases in standards of living over the past 250 years, including the doubling of her life expectancy. What made all this possible? Uh, and let me make it clear, it wasn't trade. <laughs> uh, although trade may have had some role. It was basically advances in science, in our understanding of the world around us, uh, and advances in social organization. <clears throat> our ability to organize cooperative activities to coordinate on a large scale. Economic activities through markets governed by the rule of law, collective action necessary for a modern economy and society. Politics which set the rules of the game with separation of powers, checks and balances. These were all, of course, central ideas of the Enlightenment and accept the stage for progress. Uh, and this, this really is the source of the wealth of nations. Uh, in all of these, there's a critical role of what I call the truth institutions. All these systems described require systems of assessing the truth. But all of these are now under attack. The media, the judiciary, our universities, our research institutions, our independent bureaucracy. Uh, and these are really the foundations of our post-enlightenment uh, civilization. And I think the most disturbing aspect of our political moment is the attack on our basic epistemological system with far-reaching effects on our civilization, our standards of living, and the functioning of our systems of political and social organization. Um, you know, <laughs> particular policies can be reversed, but the destruction of our institutions will take years to rectify. And uh, those are the things I think that we really need to be uh, concerned about. How, it is, uh, how what has been happening in the last few years has been undermining the basic institutions of our society. In this respect, I wanna also make one other important uh, distinction. There's a major confusion between what makes a country rich and what makes an individual rich. Individuals can become rich by taking advantage of others, by what economists call rent seeking or wealth grabbing, uh, uh, by exploiting others. There are many bases of exploitation, exploiting market power, asymmetries of information, human foibles and vulnerability, political power. And the fact of the matter is that if you look at the sources of the wealth 
of the wealthy, of a very large fraction of those who are at the top, it doesn't come from increasing the wealth of the nation. It comes from taking advantage and exploiting others. So if you think about the individuals who really enriched our society, the people who discovered uh, DNA or uh, uh, um, uh, the laser, uh, any, any of the, none of those are among the richest uh, people in our society. Um, and so the people who have really expanded our boundaries uh, are not those who have become rich. But if you think about some of the very wealthy people, uh, many of them uh, are just exploiters. Others have made an innovation, but then figured out how to use that to get monopoly power and to multiply that. The basic principle of competitive markets is that competition is supposed to drive profits down to zero, to a normal rate of return. And that means you shouldn't have these excessive accumulations of wealth, but we do. And the reason is uh, market power and exploitation. As one of the uh, leading Silicon Valley people uh, put it, competition is for losers. Uh, and uh, that is really sort of the motto of, of our uh, business leaders today. Um, <clears throat> I have repeatedly emphasized the importance of the idea of progressivism, the belief that progress is possible and is within our power to construct an economic and social system that advances progress. And we will need national strategies to address the defining problems of our time, climate change, inequality, and political stability. To that, we need a social contract that builds social cohesion, and such a social contract must be based on our shared social and political values. Um, I referred to the social contract and some of the key aspects of it earlier in my talk, uh, a new contract between government, markets, and civil society. And there are two ideas that are central to this conception that I think have not gotten sufficient attention. First is the critical role of collective action, that we can do together many things that we can't do alone. We can't address the major issues of our times, climate change, nuclear proliferation, inequality, environmental degradation, individually. Many of these are, in fact, global issues that we will have to address and con concert with others. Um, and that's why we have to develop an ethos of cooperation rather than confrontation. Government plays a key role in collective action, but I want to emphasize there is a much richer set of ways in which we cooperate together, working for the common good, spearheaded by unions and civil society, including class action suits and activities of NGOs. Secondly, there's a key role of government in regulation. Regulation has gotten a bad name in the last 40 years, but we can't live together in a complex society without regulations. Stoplights are a simple regulation, telling who can go first, then next. Without this simple regulation, we would be in perpetual gridlock. Regulations are necessary to prevent us from imposing harm on others, as we do when we pollute. One person's freedom is another's unfreedom. So working together for the common good under the new social contract will enforce our sense of common purpose. Now, I don't have time, I've already talked too long, to go through all the elements of, uh, of a progressive economics, but they include rewriting the rules uh, of the basic rules of the economy, to constrain power and its abuses, to create a more efficient and fair economy, to ensure that we live within our planetary boundaries. They also include progressive public expenditures, fair and efficient taxation, and ensuring an access to a middle class decent life for everybody. Um, if I had more time, I talk about one central set of ideas uh, uh, the importance of climate change, uh, the Green New Deal as a framework within which one can do that. Um, but I want to conclude, so I have just a few minutes uh, for uh, questions, um, 
20 years ago, uh, Seattle drew attention to the failure of our trading regime, but it was more than that. It was the failure of our economic and political system. Uh, in many ways, matters have grown worse and uh, the failures have become more apparent. And that's uh, so clear with the crises, not only uh, the cl climate crisis, the inequality crisis, and I think the political crisis that we face today. Uh, I would argue that progressive capitalism uh, is part of the answer to America's problems. As I said earlier, the old economic model has failed for over four decades. Uh, the experiment uh, should be declared uh, conclusively a failure. Mild changes are not likely to make matters much better. What is required are major changes based on what we have learned from successes and failures here and elsewhere. Uh, trade policy has to be embedded within this broader framework. We can't let secretive trade negotiations shaped by corporate, por corporate, powerful corporate interests drive our economy and shape our society. That is the message of the protest here in Seattle 20 years ago, and it is as true today as it was then. Thank you. So I know I've talked a little too loud, uh, too long, but, but uh, I think they wanted to have a chance for some questioning. Two questions? Are there microphones or? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, John Beto. I've spent the last year organizing with uh, Extinction Rebellion. And uh, the analysis uh, <laughs> held by Extinction Rebellion is that uh, electoral politics uh, is not going to be over, able to overcome uh, the power of the uh, corporations that need to be dismantled within uh, the next decade in order for us to have a chance at a habitable planet. So uh, I'm wondering uh, how it, the, this, uh, you know, the, the rebellion that we need uh, is consistent with a, a transition to progressive uh, capitalism. Okay, so uh, I think the good news is in much of the rest of the world, uh, uh, your message has gotten across uh, successfully. Uh, that, for instance, uh, the UK, uh, even with its conservative government, has committed itself to be carbon neutral by 2050. And uh, the new leadership in the EU uh, has said that it's going to be uh, moving towards uh, that we, it will have carbon, uh, they have to pass it yet, but that was the platform on which she ran uh, to be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, and there is uh, uh, increasing momentum for uh, what are called uh, uh, cross-border taxes. That is to say, if the United States doesn't impose uh, uh, get on board with the Paris Agreement, uh, it doesn't uh, get on board, board with this agenda, uh, other countries will impose tariffs against the United States. Uh, I, I think that that will change uh, some of the politics in the United States. I also think the outcome of the election in 2020 uh, could have, and I'm very hopeful, uh, will have a very big uh, effect because I think all the Democratic candidates are committed to uh, some degree of, uh, to a fairly aggressive climate policy. So I'm hopeful. I wonder if I could ask, uh, state a couple things and you could tell me if they're true or false. Uh, the Democrats in 2000, 
2009 to 2011 had 60 votes in the Senate and they had the House and they didn't increase taxes on capital gains, the rich or corporations. Second thing I think is a fact is that overpopulation is the cause of global warming and wars and many other problems. Um, another thing I think is a fact is that uh, manufacturing makes countries rich. And uh, the final fact I think is that uh, capital versus labor, capital always wants cheap labor, which has led to, anyway, I've got a bunch of other okay, things. Okay, so, so let, let me answer the, just the first one that, that I, 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 it is true that uh, I, yeah, in uh, 2008, when there was a, a democratic majority in both houses of uh, Congress, they did not uh, do a lot of things that they should have done. I think they've learned the lesson of that mistake. Uh, and I think there is a, a resolve to, uh, 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 if they got elect, uh, elected and controlled both houses of Congress, to do something very aggressively uh, in all the areas that you mentioned, including uh, uh, changing the, uh, ret restoring progressivity to our tax system, in which increasing capital gains taxes is an important ingredient. Hi, you mentioned that uh, other countries have done trade policy better than the United States. What do you think is the best example of a country that's really done trade policy right as compared to us? Well, um, Sweden act, uh, has done uh, a lot better in both what we call active labor market policies, uh, social protection, and industrial policies. So that, and, and let me explain in a way why they had to. Uh, they're a small country and they recognize that they had to be open. So they didn't have any choice about uh, trade or not trade, you know, if they, if they had to be autarkic, if they had to rely, they, they just couldn't function. So they had to be open, and so they asked the question, if we're going to be open and we are committed to democracy, and they have a strong democratic tra uh, tradition, and they're committed to transparency, they were the first country that passed uh, right to know laws. So, the, you know, with that commitment, they said, what do we, what do we do? And the, the answer was that we have to make sure that there are no significant groups of losers as a result of globalization. And they designed the policies that worked reasonably well. Not perfect, but they worked reasonably well. And uh, to me, you know, some people say, well, it's a small country, how can you make, uh, it's precisely because it's a small country that it had to do it, but it actually makes it much more difficult doing it because in a large country, uh, you can move people, you know, there's some areas that are growing, some areas that are, uh, in a small country, you have limited resources and it's more likely that you're going to uh, have something that will hurt you in trade for the whole country, whereas we are more diversified. So I think the argument that is, that, that uh, uh, they could do it and we can't is wrong. I think we actually have more resources and a greater cap capacity to do that. Thank you. How do you think that a, new, a Green New Deal, if it were adopted as economic and social policy in the United States, how would that change our global economic trade relationships? Well, uh, you know, first, uh, you know, the basic idea of the Green New Deal is that we have a climate crisis, we have to do something very urgently, and that just like, uh, uh, we needed to do something very urgently when President Roosevelt uh, got elected, recognizing that we'd had four years of depression and we didn't want to have another four years of depression. And that was what the New Deal. I actually think that wartime mobilization may be a better analogy. When, you know, you're fighting a war, you had to mobilize all your resources. Uh, that, uh, um, and, and, and sometimes people say, can we afford it? And the answer is when we went to war, nobody said, can we afford uh, fighting the Germans? We can't afford not to. Yeah, and the, the answer was you can't afford not to do it, just like 
we, had to, we couldn't afford not to fight World War II. So, uh, and I think we actually, the amount of resource, it, 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 we could easily mobilize the requisite resources. Um, I think in terms of, uh, it would lead to a, a period of innovation, just like World War II did, that as you go to, to fight a war, you have to innovate and you have to mobilize resources, which is one of the reasons why it's also a social agenda. In World War II, we brought women into the labor force. Uh, we uh, moved people from the rural to the urban sector. So we really reform, changed our society in fundamental ways. Um, and that's part of the basic idea behind the Green New Deal. We can take advantage of this moment to restructure our society as well as our economy. Um, and so uh, it could be a, put us at a, a real big advantage. You know, people talk about a national mission, uh, 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 a moment where we're really changing our society, being ahead of the game. I think it would uh, provide that opportunity for us. Um, my question is about how much do these trade agreements throw shade on uh, indigenous right abolishment? In other words, around the world, how many indigenous peoples are losing their sovereignty because of these trade agreements? Examples, Brazil, Bolsonaro, China, the Uyghurs, uh, North America, the uh, people who protect the water, Nestle's? Yeah, so I think uh, it is important in our trade relations to, to recognize these other values. Uh, and we, in, in some ways, we've recognized that uh, in our official positions. For, so, for instance, uh, we say uh, you cannot trade in goods produced by convict labor um, as you know, a, a basic uh, trade principle. Uh, we haven't really grasped the fact that almost 5% of America's industrial output is now produced by convict labor. So uh, it's not just a matter of trade, it's also a matter of domestic policy. But I think we need to expand the scope for what we mean by goods produced in an uh, inappropriate way from convict labor to other areas like uh, areas, I mentioned, goods produced in a way that destroys uh, our planet. Uh, and that's the cross-border tax that I talked about before. But also there are these broad human rights issues that are now being raised. And when I said, as uh, we have to develop a new framework as we move to a world in which we don't share common values, the, that will be one of the hardest issues that I think we'll, uh, we're gonna have to be addressing is how do we bring those issues uh, in into our trade policy? Uh, and I think they have to be brought in in one way or another. Oh, it, it's really up to you, guys. More. One? One more, okay. Okay, <laughs> okay I, th I think it's my turn. Uh, my question, I understand that NAFTA 2.0 would allow big pharma to really impact drug prices in Canada, probably elsewhere. Um, what can we do? and? What can the Canadian? I'm acquainted with a lot of Canadians. They don't. They know the situation. They don't know what they can do to fight it. I don't know what we can do to fight it in this country. Do you have any suggestions? Well, I I think uh, th this is an issue which uh, is currently under uh, discussion between the, the Democratic uh, leadership and the Trump administration, I'm very hopeful that the agreement that is going to be coming out will be uh, much improved. Uh, and 
uh, maybe when you ask what can you do, is uh, uh, write to your congressman to uh, reinforce the view that unless that is done, uh, the new trade agreement should not be passed. Okay, so that and, should... And, and, you know, that's one set of provisions. Uh, there are other provisions that you might want to uh, raise about the new trade agreement. But because remember, the important thing is uh, the Democrats have made it clear that they will not pass it in the form in which uh, it, uh, it was negotiated. Okay. And so it will be changed. And uh, there are, you know, uh, th they are moving in the right direction. And it may be that they may need some resolve. Uh, and uh, you can be sure that the pharmaceutical industry will push back. And so it, it, it is important that uh, uh, our congressional representatives know how strongly people feel about that. So in other words, say that that alone is enough, that feature alone is enough to kill NAFTA 2.0. I, I think uh, that is, uh, at least uh, from what I've heard, a red line for a, at least a, enough Congress people that uh, it, it won't go through uh, unless they do something significant about that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Several people clapped, so I must have not heard you properly or understood properly. Um, I thought you said that um, progressive capitalism will result in um, being lifted to the middle class for everybody. Is that what you said? No, what did she say? Yeah. Uh, can you repeat the statement, please? Um, that progressive capitalism will result in um, the middle class uh, being lifting up everybody. But that would destroy the environment and the climate, and so, okay. I, so I must have heard you wrong. Okay, so what I, uh, there are a couple of things. I, I, I didn't have time to, to elaborate uh, uh, what I said. What, 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 if I had had more time, what I would have said is the following. Just ensuring uh, that we uh, resolve issues like how do we make our economy more competitive, how do we get the right regulations in place uh, for lots of the other areas uh, won't necessarily ensure uh, that uh, most Americans have access to a basic decent lifestyle. They won't have access. Uh, we, we still have a problem of access to education. We have, uh, uh, how do we make sure they have uh, a access to uh, uh, decent housing, adequate retirement, uh, a whole set of things that are basic uh, uh, ingredients uh, to what I would call a decent life. There's another issue I think that, that uh, you're, you're concerned with, which is um, if we all have uh, what we would view as a middle class income, uh, can our planet survive? And uh, that question, I think the answer is uh, yes, but we have to change the nature of the way our economy operates. So the question is, can, is it technically feasible to uh, have, uh, uh, to live within our planetary boundaries with incomes that are, uh, sort of, you know, where we have decent health care, uh, uh, housing, uh, nutrition? And I think the answer is clearly yes. Uh, the, I did a report with uh, Nick Stern uh, um, on what it would take in order to achieve the 1.5 degree or 2 degree centigrade goals of, of, of the Paris agreements. And uh, we had an commi international commission on this. And our consensus was that we could achieve that with actually a relatively moderate perturbation to our economy. Um, not business as usual, that's clear. I mean, we're gonna miss it significantly on business as usual. 
but it's not like uh, it, 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 it was remarkably within our grasp. And one way of thinking about it is the uh, change in energy price that would be required to achieve that is smaller than many of the variations in energy prices that we've had over the last 40 years. So it's, you know, and we've lived through those energy price changes where energy prices go up and down and we live through them. So it's, it's not something that we can't, you know, uh, obviously uh, the owners of the coal companies are not going to be happy. Uh, so there are going to be some people who will be losers, but our society as a whole will be the winner. Can I just quickly? Uh, it, it's great having Professor Stiglitz back at Town Hall and uh, give him a big hand. We really appreciate it.